Strap yourself in, put on your helmet, start your engines, for it's time for Hondas at Hollet. I'm Shang, welcome to Gas and Watts. Let's get racing. This past weekend was the second Hondas at Hollet and Abe and I got to participate in the track event that was held parallel to the Honda car show that day. Abe got to test out a few suspension upgrades to his GS300 while this was my first track day experience which I have to say was amazing and there's just so much information that I want to unpack for you so let's just get started. Here's what you need to know for your track day experience. Let me put up the schedule for Hondas at Hollet. You can kind of see when the gates open for the event and when it ends for Saturday. I should mention that this was a two day event and Abe and I only attended the first day, which had the track event and the car show at the same time. But what I want to kind of do here is kind of break up the schedule a little bit into kind of three sections. I'm going to kind of skip over the highlighted section in the schedule since Abe and I didn't really participate much in the car show itself. But I will mention that there were a lot of people that were in the car show that were also tracking their car that day, which was pretty awesome. As the name of the event suggests, it was highly recommended that you bring a Honda to track that day. But you weren't limited to just Hondas, you can bring any make or model that you wanted to. Hence why Abe was able to bring his GS300. Of course, he wasn't the only odd man out. There were actually a few Miatas out there as well as a Golf GTI. And also one of the instructors brought his Porsche out to run that day as well. I digress a little bit though. So let's kind of split up the schedule here into three sections where we have the opening of the gates and the start of the event and then the morning session, and then after lunch, the afternoon session. And as you saw on the schedule, the gates at Hollet opens at seven in the morning, and you definitely wanna get there a bit early, especially if you didn't reserve any paddocks or anything like that for your vehicle. You really wanna get there about 10 to 15 minutes early so you can claim a spot around the track. We actually arrived 15 minutes early, and there were already still a few cars ahead of us in line to get into the track. Also, depending on how far you live away from the track, if you're driving there that day, you'll probably even start your day even earlier. Since I'm pretty far from the track, my day actually started at 3 in the morning, just so that I can kind of get ready and then meet up with Abe. Now, Abe also didn't get much sleep that day because he was up late kind of preparing his car for the day ahead. So he didn't get much sleep either. So what you can kind of expect from your track day experience is that you'll probably not get much sleep the day before. But don't worry about that. The adrenaline is going to wake you right up when you get to the track. Once you get into the track, the day seems to kind of just fly by. If you remember the schedule, it kind of looks like there's a lot of downtime in between each session that you get. But it seems like when you blink, it's time to run again. It's kind of interesting. Now you can kind of tell me if this is kind of like a first track day experience for me that the time just kind of flew by or if like if you're a little bit more experienced in the track day that it's a little bit slower for you and you do have a little bit more downtime. Leave a comment below, let me know what you think. The other thing I want to kind of highlight at the start of the event is that all the drivers that are going to drive on the track have to attend a driver's meeting in the morning. And it basically goes over the day's rules and all the flags that you may see on track. They just want to make sure that you understand what you're seeing and be safe out there. Now, if you're a first time driver like me, you also have to attend a first timers meeting in the tower. And here's the tower for Hollet here. Basically, it's an additional meeting where the instructor will tell you some more information about how the sessions will go like in the morning where they'll be riding along with you to kind of show you how the track is supposed to be driven. And then you'll be on your own in the afternoon session. If you notice, there was a group 3A and a group 3B in the schedule. These were the first timers at Hollet. 
and they were split up in the morning so that there was enough instructors to kind of show each one of us the ropes of the course. The extra information that we got from the meeting was pretty important. It kind of highlighted that this was not a wheel-to-wheel -wheel race and then that you were not allowed to just pass somebody. There were actually passing zones that were marked by two cones, one at the beginning of the passing zone and one at the end of the passing zone. As well as for every passing zone, you had to give a signal to the driver behind you by pointing out of your window for them to pass. Now, it was also said that you can't have your finger out just leaving it out if you had multiple cars behind you. If you had your multiple cars behind you and multiple people needed to pass you, you needed to give each driver an indication that they could pass you. And you could only give so many people a chance to pass you because each of the drivers that you allow to pass you had to finish passing you by the end of the passing zone. So if they didn't pass you before the end of the passing zone, they could they were not allowed to pass you. So they would just have to kind of wait for the next passing zone and you would have to indicate that you will allow them to pass. Now, most of the time, you'll have them pass on the driver's side of you and you can just kind of point out of the window. But in some of the turns, they'll have to pass to the right of you. So how do you do that? Well, the instructor has also told you that you had to reach out your window and point to your right to indicate that you were, they were allowed to pass you on the right. So you had to make a big gesture so that they could see that they could pass you on those passing zones if they needed to pass you on the right. So if it's your first time, you're gonna feel like there's just a lot of information right off the bat, but don't feel too intimidated. It may seem like you're drinking from a fire hose, but they're there to help you. And at any time you can kind of grab an instructor and ask him question. So they're very helpful out there and they want you to be safe. As we started the morning session, Abe and I actually missed the parade laps, which if you're new like me, kind of gives you the opportunity to get a little bit more familiar with the track a bit. And parade laps are basically low speed, usually around 40 miles per hour, and you get to go around the track twice, which is also a good opportunity for people to kind of warm up their cars a little bit as well. We were also actually broken up into three different groups that day. These groups are the levels of the drivers and it's actually determined by you. You sign up for the level that fits you best. In this case, there's HPDE, novice, intermediate, and advanced. I was in group three, which were the HPDE or high performance driving education group. And then there was group one, which was the novice group, which was what Abe signed up for. And then there was group two, which was actually a combination of the intermediate and advanced drivers. Since Abe and I were in two different groups, we actually thought it was kind of an opportunity for us to observe and kind of record each other's runs to kind of give feedback to each other. But even with two groups in between our sessions, it seemed like we were pulled into different conversations. I was also pulled away from Abe's first session by the instructor that wanted to kind of show us the dash cam video of him running the track. It was actually a very helpful video to watch because it kind of showed the speeds he was going into the corners and then exiting them. Of course, I didn't come anywhere close to the speeds that he was taking those corners, but it's something to improve on later. Also, since Abe brought his GS300 to the event, there were a lot of people that were interested in his setup and his modifications that he's done to the vehicle. So he was pulled away in a lot of conversations, as well as other people showing their car and their setup as well. For the morning session, Abe actually went out pretty strong. He actually hit his personal best of 1 minute 38.649 seconds in his first session, but was kind of held back a little bit in his second session when he kind of hit a bit of traffic and he couldn't get past it. For me, the first two sessions in the morning was with an instructor, my first session, Lewis, my instructor, was pointing out different lines and breaking points for the corners, as well as how to accelerate out of them. I didn't track the times for these two sessions in the morning, but Lewis did ask me for the first session if I felt like the times were fast. I actually was pretty honest with him and I said that, no, I actually feel like it's pretty slow. And he was actually pretty nice to me and he said that, yeah, just kind of get to know the track a little bit. This is your first time, so understand the track and 
aim for time a little bit later. My second session with Lewis went much better. I think the information that he kind of gave me kind of stuck into my head or something because I was driving much more confident in the second session and it felt much faster as well. Lewis also commented that it seemed like I was much more confident in my second session and told me to remember that don't let my adrenaline take over and to always stay in control, which was actually a really good advice. After that, we actually went to grab some lunch and then after lunch, there was a, actually a second parade lap that Abe and I missed as well. Bernard, one of Abe's good friends, came out to support the track day and he was actually keeping an eye on the weather and it was actually kind of getting a bit bad. So we actually thought that it would be a good idea to end with the second session in the afternoon and start heading home so we can beat the bad hail that was expected that day. For the afternoon sessions, there was actually a chance for a passenger to come along with you on ride-alongs. Bernard actually went out with Abe in his first session in the afternoon to kind of give pointers to how he can improve different things on the track, which must have helped because I rode with Abe in his second session and he hit another personal best of 138 flat, which he got pretty excited as you can see here. Of course, I was kind of more focused on the track so I didn't celebrate with him and I couldn't really hear him, but I knew he was celebrating his personal best. For my first and last session of the day, I went out alone and this time I was able to track my time. Each lap seemed to be faster and faster and I hit a best of 152.293 in the ILX, which isn't the best time, but it was my first time out and it wasn't my car and I was kind of a bit nervous to push it too hard. So I'll take the time for my first time out. I probably could have ran a second time, but I was actually pretty motion sickness from riding along with Abe, which was kind of interesting because I felt nothing throughout the whole session. But as soon as we pitted, it just kind of flowed in and I felt so sick. I needed to kind of stand up and get some fresh air before we left for the day. Even though we kind of left a little bit early that day, I learned a lot from the track event. My biggest surprise was how much the car actually rolled into the corners and how much I kind of had to fight to kind of stay in my seat. It doesn't seem like that in the video, but I was kind of just fighting to stay steady in the ILX and the GS3. In fact, every time Abe would brake, I felt like I would slip down through the seats. It was kind of crazy. So the suspension in your car really matters in, on a track. The ILS was pretty unstable and I felt like it was kind of rolling into a lot of the corners while the GS wasn't rolling as much, but it was kind of pushing me side to side a, a bit. I think seats and suspension upgrades are definitely worth it if you're going to track your car. All in all, it was a great experience. The instructors were great and very, very helpful and willing to help in any way possible. The drivers around the event were great as well. I met a lot of cool new people. So if you have ever thought about doing a track day, definitely give it a try. You'll be glad that you did. Also, you don't need a fully modded out car for a track day. Just go with your stock car. Just make sure the car is good and that it passes all the checklist requirements that the track is asking of you and usually there's a checklist that comes with every track day event. Now, if you want to see Abe and I kind of go through a checklist for Haul It, I'll leave a description down below where we did it for the ILX to make sure that the car was ready to go. And I'll also link it to the video that pops up at the end here. You can actually learn a lot from just driving your stock car, what specific upgrades you actually need to improve and what things you just need to improve as a driver yourself. So. Don't be afraid to drive your stock car. It's okay. Everyone's out there to have fun. So go out and have fun. Track days are so much fun and I think I'm hooked. But the next time, I need to bring my own car. And I've actually been working on trying to get a specific car for quite some time now. It's been itching at the back of my head to get this vehicle. And I think I'm really close to pulling the trigger. But I'll have to show you next time. With that, please like the video if you enjoyed it, consider subscribing to the channel, find out which car I'm going to track and possibly drift in. Thank you for watching, have a great one, I'll see you next time.